this part of the world, for whatever reason, is a bit of a, a bit of a hidden gem. People bypass it, they don't really know it exists. So to be able to share it with people that I, I know from back in London is great. And, and not only just to share it, but to see the delight on their faces when they turn a corner and they see the cliffs or they see the water or they see sand dunes. 2011 census said that 97.3% of BAME communities lived in cities. And if you're saying that there's over, I think, what, 8 million people who identify as BAME, there's not many people who live in urban areas. Less than 3% of BAME communities live in rural areas. You know, so we have lost that connection with natural spaces. You know, this, this country is, is, is wonderful, but it does fail in some respects. And, and one of those is, is how they treat people who, who aren't necessarily white or look or white passing. Um, to the extent that if, if you aren't, you feel that to, to have an enjoyable life, you have to be around people who are like you and you have to feel safe. And that means that you stay in the cities, that you build a community and you build a, a lifestyle and a culture around cities. If you're talking about outdoor spaces where you see an absence of people of colour, you don't have to travel that far. You don't have to travel to Wales or Scotland or Ireland. In fact, you, you hardly have to go outside of the M25 to find places that are predominantly white. Even if there are people of colour living in that neighbourhood. I live in South London. And I have woods near me where I go running once or twice a week and you rarely see people of colour. The overarching one is that people of colour don't feel as though they belong or don't feel that they're welcome. Now, a lot of the response to that, the classic response is that no one's, no one's stopping you going outdoors. But if you can imagine if you've been brought up in, in a city, say you're brought up in, in Hackney, on the ninth floor of a tower block. You don't have a garden. Um, your, your nearest outdoor um, engagement with nature is the local park, but you're 15 years old, so you can't actually go into the local park because it's out of your territory. The, the nature outside your block of flats is, is urban foxes. It's rats, it's squirrels, it's pigeons. So kind of rodents and vermin. Any of, the, any of the plants that are planted around your neighbourhood are, are maybe holly or thorns, you know, rose bushes, vandal proof plants. And, and as soon as you step outside your door, you've got your game face on. If you go to the local park, if you're lucky enough to be able to have access to the local park, it's football pitches. You know, you might get a little corner of, uh, of, of the park that's let over to stinging nettles and buttercups or whatever, but that's, that's nature for you. So first of all, imagine that and then putting yourself underneath 200 foot cliffs in Wales next to the ocean. I mean, it's hugely intimidating. Now, imagine yourself of being the only person who looks like you in a totally different culture. It's, it's like a white boy from Hampstead going to Kampala in Uganda walking down the market and seeing if you can have a game of football with the local lads. It's that intimidating. How do you even, how do you even start that conversation? You also have to understand, you know, what are your access points? What are your on-ramps for people? You can't just, can't just say, oh look, there it is, come and have a go. People, people are too scared to do that. You have to talk to them in, in terms and in a language, both a written language and a visual language that they understand and they can identify with. If you've grown up with it, if your parents or your grandparents or your friends or your uncles and you live in that space, it becomes second nature to you. As a lot of these kids back in London can tell you what trainers you wear with what jeans. They couldn't tell you what shoes you wear when you go for a hike. Growing up, I was called every name under the sun. You know, we know what they are, right? And you've got 
bullied and people would laugh at you and you'd turn up with a, a pair of skis or with, or with a belly board or on a, on a bike in, uh, out in the countryside and, and you'd get looks and people would kind of look over your shoulder to see who you were with and couldn't, and couldn't really work it out and it, it goes with the territory, absolutely goes with the territory and I was very fortunate that when I was young my, um, my grandfather just pushed me out on these things. He'd send me out to camps for a week or two weeks, something like that over the summer holidays or winter holidays, where it was just, just me. And you just had to get on with it, like loads of other kids, but just me, the only, the only black kid there. So it's either you, you put up with it or, or you crumble really, or you just sit in a corner and cry. But I, I found a love of being in outdoor spaces, being up mountains, being in forests, being on ad adventure trips, swimming, surfing, whatever. And, and that shared love kind of broke a lot of barriers with the people that I was with. I've been involved in action sports um, most of my life to some degree and have had so much enjoyment, so much fun, got so much positive energy. I feel a connection to nature. Humans are animals. We grew up around nature. To deny that to people is an offence. Everyone has the right to put their hands in the earth, to walk out over sand dunes, to go next to the beach and to breathe in fresh air and to feel as though they belong in that space, to feel free. I remember down at the, the local beach, getting on a, a belly board and catching waves as a preteen that really opened up that idea of freestyle sports and freestyle living. I, I can pinpoint it down almost to a day where catching a couple of waves said, well, you know, there, there aren't any rules. You can kind of do what you want. There's, there's no teams here. There's no winners or losers. It's just about going out and, and having fun. Yeah, two or three years ago, when I went out on a, on a job, actually, and it was, um, it was a trail running job. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a fantastic event. In my, in my naivety at the time, expected to see this event, it's ultra running 100 miles around mountains, to be dominated by East Africans in the same way that a lot of the, the marathons are. And I got there and I saw one black man running. And it was a bit of a shock. I thought, well, why is that? Came home, questioned it, and realized very quickly that no one had done any work on this area about, essentially, people of color in the outdoor world. So I looked around and thought, well, surely someone should be doing something about this and <laughs> realised that maybe I was one of those people. So that's kind of what got me into the space and why I started up uh, the Outsiders Project, which is really um, to try and uh, educate people, both consumers and, and brands, about some of the barriers um, some of the context and some of maybe the solutions about getting minority groups into the outdoor landscape. I think there's a, a huge responsibility on the people who shape what we class as the outdoor industry. So the national governing bodies, um, the brands, the organisations who, who claim to care about the outdoors. And we have to ask them those difficult questions about what the outdoors actually is, not just in their perception, but how it can be for everybody.